And it's now my immense pleasure to introduce Nora Khan. Uh, Nora will give uh, an introduction, uh, introductory speech, and we'll then have an in-conversation. Uh, Nora is an American uh, writer of fiction, non-fiction, literary criticism, um, all plays a role in, uh, in her work, and we got to know each other because whenever I started to basically work with an artist who kind of connects to the realm of the digital, Nora had written uh, the ultimate text. It all started actually with Nora writing essays about games. She writed, uh, started to write about games approximately seven, eight years ago, and then little by little shifted from there uh, into art, has a, written an amazing piece in Moos magazine, which you can all read online, which is about how artists work with augmented uh, reality. We are collaborating at the moment with Nora on two catalogues for the Serpentine, one on Sandra Perry uh, and one on Ian Cheng. Um, and it's my immense pleasure to now give the microphone to Nora for her speech. And then we'll also open it to the floor for everything you always wanted to know on how artists engage with AR and VR. A very, very warm welcome to Nora Khan. Thank you, Hans Ulrich and thank you for having me. So at Rhizome, based at New Museum, I work with and write about artists who use new and emerging technology to try and answer some of the vital issues that have emerged repeatedly in the last few days. So surveillance capitalism, an AI-driven economy, machine learning-driven facial recognition. And so many of the artists in this field are unsurprisingly activists, along with being theorists and programmers and engineers and game designers. And virtual reality and augmentation are increasingly their tools. And many artists are key to the co-development of these technologies as they test and break and reconfigure them. So even as there's a lot of skepticism about VR as an industry, the potential is expanding, especially as artists use the same game engines across industries to simulate scenarios. So climate change, economic disasters, and other likely crashes. And my own interest in game design and simulations uh, come in art comes from my dad, who was a physicist and worked at NASA for 20 years on the state's last planned man mission to Mars, uh, simulating how gravity would affect spacesuit material on the space station. And so he would model that over time. That's what I grew up around. And because simulations so often look like games, uh, a lot of fun conspiracy theories emerge, which reflect how crucial game modeling has become for every aspect of social and political engineering. So on to the artists who exemplify this thinking. The first artist is Jakob Steensen, who is a Danish VR artist and has been artist resident at Unreal. And here's a scene from Aquaphobia, which is a virtual landscape in Red Hook, Brooklyn. And while journeying through the sewers and subterranean infrastructure, we get a sense here of what this area will look like when flooded. And Steenson takes us very patiently through a mix of science fiction-inspired futurism while using intense research of the flora and fauna of the area. And he spends months and months detailing many of these plants, animals, the concrete of what would happen, uh, the co what would happen to concrete over time underwater, and then demonstrates how VR can bring us to explore what it would be like to be partly submerged by water or around it most of the time and what it will feel like to have the sediments under the city floor churned and released, and what new animals and fauna will be around. Let me take a little time to look at this. They're absolutely stunning. Here's some still shots of the underwater, uh, sort of the subterranean like sewer networks, which he actually like, went down, modeled, and brought back up for us to see. The next artist I wanted to look at is Tabita Rezer, who's uh, Guyanese Danish and living in Johannesburg. And her aesthetic is a little bit different from Jakob. She's more in the tradition of found art and old net art, in which her material is the digital. And here, this film is called Deep Down Tidal. She takes topographical maps of the seabed and does a fly through or swim through along fiber optic cable networks, which map atop old colonial shipping routes and the transatlantic slave trade with their drowned cargo. In her practice, the infrastructure of the internet becomes a way to investigate how the digital is used as a social tool for organizing power in the very old way, 
through extraction and commodification of people and their thinking and energy. That extraction, of course, maps onto class and racial dynamics. And in her view, and many others, the neutrality of the internet and AI and all systems must be constantly challenged and undone and unstitched, as people make systems and ideology too. But there is also healing possible through this journey, as her VR installs are frequently accompanied by healing rituals, suggesting the digital as the space we bring to almost all of our impulses too, spiritual and religious, and whatever we're not finding off screen. All of these artists that we'll see today uh, through VR and AR exemplify really playful and experimental uses of technology while having critical weight. And I think of them as continuing the legacy of art and engineering and art and software uh, from Bell Labs and Nine Evenings on, which feels more and more vital. These artists embrace how flexible we must be to adapt to the collapsed perspectives and rapid scaling that the digital demands. The next artist is Sam Rolfes, who crosses VR, experimental sound, design, and concert visuals. He's a background as a painter, as most of these artists have a background in fine art and went, came to the technology with those skills. In this video for the group Amnesia Scanner, he orchestrated detailed choreography to have us come into the body of a festival goer and then creates an electronic music festival around him. And the video is a live cut of a performance. It's a gaming rig that he built himself with one player using a PlayStation 4 controller that controls stage movement, lights, and refraction, and another player who's controlling leg movement with a rift, an Oculus Rift. And the combination of the two tools is a technical feat, which is meant to push the body into real-time performance in the disorientation, the overwhelming atmosphere, and extremity of the music itself. Rolfus pushes virtual and augmented reality into being artistic tools, experimental tools, rather than fetish objects. And in less overwhelming pieces, he uses the same techniques to augment figures, such as in this complex cover, Danny Brown, the rapper, is deconstructed and stretched, reflecting the musician's own approach to trap and rap. Tian Zhao Lei from Beijing has a slightly darker vision of technology as a natural system that is evolving largely independently of us. People will become the products that help technology evolve, drawing on our very predictable needs. Song of Joy, this film, is one of his most seminal pieces. And the film takes place on an island and is a visual poem about consumption and tech and desire as they feed one into the other. His use of models visualizes technology as it collapses ancient cultures in with hyper-futuristic modernity and pushes the acceleration of this to an extreme end. And much like Tabitha Rizer, his work suggests the uncanny and mutating form that technology takes the kind of all-consuming religion it's become for many of us. And the last artist is Miriam Benani whose practice is augmentation, meaning she takes elements of reality in film and video and tweaks them. She was first famous for cartooning on Instagram, small videos in which she overlaps animation and experimental effects as a way to comment on an often surreal reality. Where the previous artists are quite high-tech, Miriam's cartooning is, to use Hanel Rick's term, lo-fi and warm and accessible. And this is the kind of training everyone is already doing on their phone in subtle ways, practicing hybridity with the digital and thinking in it and blending in with it and putting ourselves in it. Benani's augmentation techniques enhance through humor a sense of connection to others so we can look at Trump with an old king's hairstyle in most rooms here, I think, laugh together. So these artists suggest multiplicity of narratives and histories and futures and their vision of a relationship to technology is largely empowered and one of cautious interpretation and hybridity. So if chaos is the norm, the more we can think in terms of simulation, it seems, the more we can adapt to an unpredictable world. Thank you.
Nora, thank you so much. Another big round of applause for Nora Khan. Now, my first question is I wanted to link it to the morning debate we had um, just before the lunch break with uh, Evgeny Morozov and Hito Steyl. And Hito had suggested that we re-invite Evgeny to DLD and that she wanted to exchange with him as part of our interview. And you told me just before that Evgeny is also one of your favorite writers. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit what interests you about his work. Absolutely. I see... Well, my approach to game writing and writing about digital art has always been driven by the values that I think a lot of engineers and artists want to see in these worlds, and that art becomes the space in which they're able to enact that. And we have, in the States, I mean, it's been a pleasure to be at DLD where we talk about surveillance capitalism openly. Uh, a lot of the activist spaces in New York or in throughout the States are the only places that I can have those conversations. And to be in a space where that is spoken about openly is a thrill. But I think the artists that I work with often make a space in which we can start to imagine what a life not under surveillance would look like, what an equitable system would look like that can represent, for example, Sandra Perry's work that's going to be at the Serpentine this spring. In writing that essay about her, she opens up how code and AI are constantly spaces in which we put in the bias and the biases that we already have in real life. And so the more artists who are programmers and are engineers and are involved with that are able to like speak in that language, I think we'll be able to come up with more. So Jana yeah, P and I decided with, together with our chief technology officer, Ben Vickers, to actually have this uh, double exhibition of Sandra Perry and Ian Cheng, which will be in March at the Serpentine and Serpentine Sackler in, uh, in London. And um, I thought of, because you mentioned Sandra, I wanted to ask you also about Ian, because of course you've written a lot on, on Ian Cheng's practice and he completely changes the idea of what moving images because he makes these algorithmic pieces, which as long as there is electricity, they will continue to change, they will continue to evolve. Um, there's in one of the pieces, there's an entire civilization which at a certain moment has a seismic impact and starts to revamp and restart. Um, yet at the same time, he now, uh, after presenting actually at MoMA PS1 this emissary series uh, of sort of permanently evolving um, moving image work, he now moves one step further and he goes into AI and develops this character. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about your approach to Ian's work and how he connects to what you just said about, you know, Evgeny and how artists can answer to that. Well, Ian's work is exceptional in that he has a background in cognitive science. He's also thinks like a fiction writer, he thinks like a novelist, and then he comes to the worlds that he builds with those skills. And he wants to be able to envision a space in which we can understand that AI is an intelligence that we're gonna to learn to live alongside and that we co-evolve with. And in enacting the simulations that go on without us, we're taught to get used to an ontology and perspective that isn't ours. And that's increasingly going to be the world that we're in. AI isn't going anywhere um, and drives much of society and the systems that we're in. And so Ian's work is a poetic approach to that. It's a place in which we can like, come and vi witness these like virtual beings and start to take them seriously. I think um, a lot of these issues have been like siloed in niche areas, but they're now pervasive if, hid if hidden. What makes your research uh, so special is that you look uh, actually in all geographies on all continents mm -hmm. into artists to engage with AR and VR. And um, given your encyclopedic knowledge, I thought it's a good thing that we open it to all of you. So if you have questions to Nora, uh, we could take them now. Otherwise, I've got many more questions, but I'm sure there are questions from the floor. Urgent questions? Yes, John? I think a lot of artists are starting to see the value and importance and vitality of like collaboration with people outside of their field. I know more artists are working with writers, with poets, with science fiction writers that were inspiring to them, with engineers and programmers to be able to create spaces in which they have not this silo 
kind of effect that you're talking about, which actually it happens all the time, especially artists working with technology get moved into a kind of area where they don't have the efficacy or the impact that their work really should have. And I think it's gonna be through collaboration. I think going back to what Hans Ulrich was talking about yesterday, the history of artists and engineers working with each other goes back to Bell Labs, you had Lillian Schwartz, you had Robert Rauschenberg wandering um, the halls of these companies. And allowing artists that, that space and risk, I think is becoming harder and harder to do. And that's why artists, when they come together around ideas, are able to continue that. Hopefully that's an answer. You mentioned Billy Kluver and the experiments yeah. in art and technology, because mm -hmm. in England, there was, of course, the initiative of John Latham and Barbara Stevini. They came up with the idea of the art displacement group. And uh, they basically said that every major company uh, and administration should have an artist in residence. You know? So they placed artists. So whoever of you has a company or runs an institution, there should always be an artist involved. Do we have more questions? Yeah, we've got a question. Yeah, so this is a question for both of you. You said in this nexus between technology, society, and art, what is one thing in the past few years that surprised you, and what can we learn from it? I think how people are approaching AI in a non anthropomorphic way, like we're starting to see people engage with artificial intelligence as it is without loading it up with the fears and the worries that I think uh, usually AI narratives are surrounded with. And I think artists are, have been key to having that come in. Uh, and that we will be able to deal with like the risks that AI poses or that like bad design that AI poses because we have people who are speaking that language more. So I see less siloing. I see like artists are willing to work with technology companies to go in to be residents in these spaces that they might be like ideologically fundamentally opposed to. You have more critics coming into these spaces because there's a fundamental gap in language that has to be bridged and I think many artists are trying to like bridge that. But also be humble too about what they don't know. Yeah, that's very important. And of course there was this, you know, exchange, the fam famous exchange between Cocteau and, and Diaghilev. The, uh, they call it Eton et no surprise me. And I think that question of surprise you know, it's why I am a curator, because whenever I work with a great artist, you know, that's what happens. So I cannot pick out one example, but I can maybe give you a few examples why I think it's important that this étonnement is carried, you know, into society. So for example, John Latham, you know, worked for the Scottish government. He placed himself, because starting this art displacement group with Barbara Stavidi, you know, he felt he has to lead the example. So he placed himself in government and, uh, you know, he explained to the Scottish government that they shouldn't remove these huge heaps of coal in, in, you know, in Scotland, uh, which would have cost them millions of pounds to do so, but they should actually keep them. And already in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, he declared these to be kind of monuments of a bygone age, you know, of the coal age, because he, he was aware that we needed to find more environmentally friendly forms of energy. And you know, today, these are land art pieces that were preserved, and uh, it produced reality. Another example would be, at some point, uh, the mayor of Manchester uh, realized that he needed to follow this example. So he invited Peter Saville to be uh, yeah, the cultural kind of advisor, director of the city. And uh, Peter, it was 12 years ago, you know, Peter went to Manchester and had, he sort of was wondering what does Manchester need? Uh, and kept, came with this very surprising idea that in order to put Manchester on the map, there should be an example of a festival which can do what can happen nowhere else which means world premieres of unrealized great projects which usually fall between the disciplines, you know, which then allowed us, Philippe Pareno and me, to do our opera, which we want to do for many years, but allowed many, many more people to do amazing things with live art, etc. So, uh, you know, under the directorship of, of Alex Putz, who then ran the festival, but had not the mayor asked Peter Saville to come in with this surprising idea. And I think that happened again last year when we did at the Serpentine, the, you know, the John Latham show, we wanted to reactivate in London, uh, the uh, art APG idea. So he invited a Mexican artist, Pedro Reyes, you know, to visit London and arrange a residency for him, actually a, a kind of a dialogue modern residency with uh, Sadi Khan, Justin Simons, and the mayor of London's office. And you know, he came up with a seven point plan of amazing ideas of what he thinks you know, London needs. So I think, and the same thing is perfectly applicable also for big companies. Uh, it would be a permanent kind of étonnement. And, Produce reality. We can take one more question. Yeah.
I mean, this is a huge issue we deal with at Rhizome, um, archiving and protecting software and keeping it up to date is a big part of Net Art Anthology and also Web Recorder, which is this huge uh, initiative we've had going for the last two years of how do you protect software-based art and then how do you create a market for it to circulate? Because if it can be replicated, then it's fundamentally useless. So the same issues that come up in the art world are also seeping into digital art, but you have a lot of creators who want their work to be free, who want even at the great financial cost that they suffer because of it, uh, there is a huge conflict there. And I think that there is a way to do thoughtful software archiving and keeping up um, a market for digital art that you know, is healthy and but also maintains like the values that the artwork was made in the spirit of. It's a great question though. And I've got a last question for you. You know, Steffi, when she mentioned first that reconquer theme of this year's DLD, to me, you know, also evoked this idea of maybe reconquering wonder. Mm. Uh, and you've written a wonderful text where you said that you're most interested in how we manage to express joy and wonder, how we actually maintain our creative energy within the bounds of increasingly oppressive System. So uh, could you tell us about that, maybe as a matter of conclusion? Sure. So Ian's work is particularly stunning to me because it resembles poetry. And then systems, to me, also resemble poetry in that you have heavy bounds in which, which mimic the bounds that we learn to maneuver in society. And so in these systems, there's a way to find poetry, to find expression, to find creative space. And that's what people do no matter what kind of impossible situation that they're in. You can simulate a uh, situation in which a person has a space for expression, a space for community, a way to find values, which is what the digital and what the internet, that was the original prop promise when the architecture was still open. It's gone from open to closed in 20 years. And so I think we have artists and thinkers and critics who are thinking about how are we going to move forward in this untenable situation. I think maintaining a sense of hope and purpose within bounds of oppressive systems is key. So. That could not be a better conclusion. Nora, thank you so, so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.